Good afternoon, colleagues, or good morning, uh, or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Oral Pathology and Oral Biology at the University of Pretoria, welcome to the first of the invited guest lecture series of 2022. For those of you whom I haven't spoken to, and fortunately I was in contact with quite a number of you, uh, all the best for 2022, or the remainder thereof, but we hope it is really uh, everything that everybody wants the year to be. Before I'm going to introduce uh, for Brendan, just one or two housekeeping rules, please. Uh, the setting is so that everybody who joins is muted, uh, and some, sometimes uh, people escape that, but please make sure that you are muted throughout. Uh, Brendan is going to give his talk, and thereafter, there will be opportunity for questions. Uh, and as always, please make use of uh, the chat function to pose your questions, uh, and he will uh, address as many as possible uh, after the, the talk. Uh, that being said, uh, please allow me to say a few words uh, about Dr. Brendan Dixon. He is a director of the Immunohistochemistry Chemistry Laboratory in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in Mount, at Mount Sinai Hospital at the University of Toronto. He graduated from the uh, University of Toronto as MD and then undertook residency in anatomical pathology at the same institution, followed by a clinical fellowship in bone and soft tissue pathology at Pennsylvania Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. His primary research uh, interest uh, is on the improvement of diagnosis and prognosis of bone and soft tissue tumors via the application of novel molecular and immunohistochemical assay, uh, as also trying to elucidate the molecular mechanisms of sarcoma genesis. He, he and his team has recently developed a prognostic uh, index for predicting patient outcome with osteosarcomas, as well as for molecular, the development of a molecular assays for multiple bone and soft tissue neoplasms. Brendan has authored many peer-reviewed uh, publications and was involved in many invited articles and review. He has fortunately for us an avid interest in teaching which includes undergrad students, residents, and fellows, and fellows, as well as an international audience via social media. And this is an ample opportunity uh, to evidence that. Brendan, from our side, thank you for your availability to chat to us today. And we're really looking forward uh, to your uh, talk. Over to you. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, just to begin, um, I would just like to uh, disclose that I've received in the past uh, some research test kits from Illumina uh, for research application. And perhaps more importantly, uh, just to emphasize that I'm not an oral pathologist, so I'm perhaps coming at this presentation from a somewhat different perspective than many of you may be accustomed to. So uh, perhaps a slightly different um, vernacular or um, application of language here. So please bear with me. So by, by way of brief outline, uh, I'd like to just go through um, the learning objectives from this presentation, some brief background, and then the bulk of this talk will be case-based. Um, I think that's a method for which most of us uh, respond well to in, in pathology. So to begin, uh, from this presentation, I hope you will all take away uh, a practical approach to the workup of mesenchymal tumors of the head and neck. And uh, in the course of this presentation, I really want to emphasize the role of ancillary molecular testing in the workup of these neoplasms, and along the way, um, emphasize the um, presence of a number of emerging entities in mesenchymal tumors, um, particularly those arising in the head and neck, and uh, discuss some diagnostic challenges. So by way of background, I find it useful uh, when dealing with tumors at specific organ sites to consider those that are um, intrinsic or native to that tumor site. So for example, a synonasal um, um, glomangiopericytoma, or those that may perhaps occur throughout the body um, or have a predilection for that particular site. So for example, a spindle cell lipoma, for example, with a predilection for the head and neck. Um, and so we approach the workup of these tumors based on the line of differentiation, 
And the WHO classifies these tumors based on their biologic potential, be it benign or malignant or somewhere in between. But I find it also very important to consider when um, first approaching these tumors, are, are we dealing with a primary tumor? Could this be a metastasis? Could this be a potential mimic, such as a sarcomatoid carcinoma, or could this even be a non-neoplastic tissue? And with that in mind, uh, it's really, really important to emphasize that in uh, the realm of mesenchymal tumors, um, and, and arguably unlike most other specialties, we have perhaps the greatest breadth of diversity when it comes to different subtypes of tumors, um, uh, as well as um, potential uh, confounds when it comes to morphologic, immunohistochemical, and even molecular overlap amongst these entities. So it's very important to, uh, when approaching these tumors, have a comprehensive approach that draws on clinical history and imaging, uh, morphology, immunohistochemistry, and indeed molecular testing, which is uh, the, the, the emphasis of this talk. So with that said, the first case uh, that I'd like to begin with is that of a 41-year-old woman who was previously well and clinically presented with what uh, was thought on imaging and clinical grounds to be a papilloma or an anthrocoanal polyp. Uh, she underwent a biopsy, and that biopsy was read by a community pathologist as an inflamed nasal polyp with spindle cell proliferation. And here you can see that we have a polypoid uh, neoplasm with areas of uh, relative hypo and hypercellularity. On higher magnification, we can appreciate some areas of perhaps cystic degeneration. We've got a respiratory type epithelium. We have areas um, where there appears to be perhaps condensation of tumor cells below the uh, epithelium. And relatively little by way of atypia. Most of the cells are uh, quite monomorphic. We don't see any um, pleomorphism or mitotic activity. And elsewhere in the areas of greater cellularity, we have somewhat of a fascicular pattern. And again, relatively monomorphic nuclei, no significant pleomorphism and no conspicuous mitotic activity, which again, we can appreciate at higher magnification. And the referred in immuno histochemical panel was largely non-contributory, save for an S100, which uh, you can appreciate as diffusely positive. And so typically when I give talks like this uh, in, in, in a, um, a live setting with a live action uh, audience in front of me, I'll uh, invite audience uh, participation. But here, uh, given the somewhat slightly different um, uh, venue, I will just ask you all to consider what might be your differential or your favorite impression. Um, and here I'll tell you that, you know, obviously we would consider an antrocoanal polyp based on the clinical basis. Uh, we might consider a schwannoma based on the S100. Rarely synovial sarcomas can have apparent S100 expression. And then finally, perhaps a biphenotypic synonasal sarcoma. And with this differential, I submitted this case for um, RNA sequencing and received a result back uh, showing a PAX3 MAML3 fusion gene in keeping with the diagnosis of biphenotypic synonasal sarcoma. So what is biphenotypic synonasal sarcoma? Well, this was formerly known as, or initially known as low-grade synonasal sarcoma with neural and myogenic features, which is a nod to the immunohistochemical phenotype of these tumors, which typically involves S100 expression, as well as uh, variable amounts of myogenic staining. And that includes SMA, Desmond, and occasionally myogenin. Um, it so happens the case that I just showed was negative for the myogenic markers, and, and that happens from time to time. And these tumors um, are typified by a relatively bland set of morphology. Um, they are restricted to the synonasal tract with a predilection uh, for the nasal cavity and ethmoid sinus, and clinically often present with nasal obstruction, epistaxis, uh, pain, uh, and occur over a relatively broad age range, though uh, predominating um, in uh, mid-adulthood. And because they tend to be relatively infiltrative at times um, with incomplete excision can uh, recur. Uh, most of the histologic features uh, that we see in these tumors, I've, I've gone over with this one case, but I will emphasize that uh, one finding that's often quite helpful is the presence of entrapped hypoplastic uh, respiratory epithelium in these tumors. As mentioned, uh, the immunophenotype typically involves a combination of uh, neural, and by that I mean S100, uh, and myoid uh, or myogenic differentiation, such as SMA, plus or minus Desmond. Um, it may be very, very focally myogenic, but not something that you would rely on. Uh, 
And what is particularly useful, I find, is this uh, very binary pattern of S100 staining and negativity for SOX10. If you see this in this context, you can go quite far with the diagnosis just on morphology in it and immunohistochemistry alone. Most tumors, like the case I just showed, have PAX3 and MAML3 fusions, but it's important to know that other fusion partners are positive, are possible rather for PAX3. And this becomes important if you're working in a laboratory that relies on fluorescence in situ hybridization, for example. So if you're using a MAML3 probe, a break apart probe, uh, you can expect uh, this to not be diagnostically helpful if the tumor has one of these alternate fusion genes. So uh, perhaps the first introduction of an advantage of RNA sequencing that I will mention a, a few times in the course of this talk. Just uh, as an opportunity to go through the differential um, and to hit some of the other potential learning opportunities, um, an antrochoanal polyp, as most of you are aware, tends to arise in the posterior uh, maxilla. It um, protrudes through the um, osseum and often is characterized by a, a stalk, which you can see here. Um, and because of this um, rather tenuous vascular supply, uh, it's subject to torsion and you can have degenerative changes such as edema and cystic degeneration and interstitial hemorrhage. And on higher magnification, you can appreciate uh, the presence of bland spindle, spindle distillate cells. Sometimes you have a little bit of reactive atypia, but certainly no significant pleomorphism or mitotic activity. And again, just emphasizing the relatively bland cytomorphology of these tumors or lesions. Schwannomas are something that we see throughout the body, although they do um, uh, frequently occur in the head and neck and morphologically are um, somewhat diverse in their more, uh, I guess, morphologic presentation. You often have areas of hyper and hypocellularity corresponding to antony A and antony B regions, respectively. You may or may not have uh, palisading of um, cytoplasmic bands around a nuclei, the so-called varicate body. At higher magnification, you'll occasionally see a bit of atypia, some leaky hyalinized vessels, uh, and again, a bit of interstitial hemorrhage to go along with those leaky vessels. But importantly, we don't tend to see significant mitotic activity. These tumors are positive for S100, but importantly, positive for SOX10. So uh, a very, very important way of differentiating these uh, from the case at hand. Occasionally, we see malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors in the head and neck. And these two uh, are characterized by a relatively broad morphologic spectrum. Um, this particular case has areas um, with a somewhat marbled appearance where we have areas of hypo and hypercellularity. We can have myxoid stroma. Uh, mitotic activity is generally conspicuous. Uh, pleomorphism is often present. And by immunohistochemistry, these tumors are frequently uh, only focally positive for um, neural markers such as S100 or SOX10. And a helpful finding I, I tend to find is the presence of epithelioid cells clustering around vessels, as we see here. And they, in this particular case, have retained SOX10 stain. And finally, uh, coming back to the case at hand, biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma, I just want to go through a couple of more cases just to, to emphasize the morphologic spectrum of these tumors. So here's another case. Uh, you can see this uh, happened to be a curatage. Uh, and likewise characterized by a PAX3 MAML3 fusion. And at higher magnification, you can see that we have some of these areas of entrapped hyperplastic um, uh, respiratory epithelial structures um, surrounded by the tumor. This is another case, uh, likewise characterized by the most common fusion. And here you can see a somewhat different morphology. Here we've got these fascicles um, or herringbone pattern of uh, very cellular areas of tumor cells. Likewise, um, again, characterized by the effusion gene, but with this morphology, uh, it would be reasonable on morphology to wonder about the possibility of, for example, MPNST or perhaps a synovial sarcoma. But again, molecular testing here helps uh, clinch the diagnosis. Moving now to the second case, we have a tongue mass in a 57-year-old woman. And here you can see an incisional biopsy with our uh, mucosa on the uh, superior aspect. On higher magnification or intermediate magnification, you can appreciate a tumor with a uh, lobulated uh, sheet like to, sheet -like to nested pattern. On higher magnification, you can appreciate uh, 
cells that are somewhat epithelioid to spindled. The nuclei are relatively monomorphic, perhaps a bit of subtle um, atypia, some prominent nucleoli, and not a lot, uh, not any conspicuous mitotic activity in this field of view. And again, uh, just to ask yourself, uh, based on morphology, I, I will tell you that this tumor had a bit of focal S100, but was negative for a, a standard uh, spindled epithelioid panel, which includes things like SMA, Desmond, CD34, S100, and keratin. Uh, so just a blush of S100, but nothing that you would really uh, use to rely on a definitive diagnosis. And, and here now a differential. And a reasonable differential might include a Ewing sarcoma, in particular, the large cell variant of Ewing's, which has a bit more cytoplasm than is usual. You might wonder about alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. You might wonder about an epi a myoepithelial carcinoma or something in the myoepithelial tumor family. Uh, and you might also wonder about a so-called GLE-1 altered soft tissue tumor. So I submitted this case for RNA sequencing and here's our result. A mallet one GLE-1 fusion in keeping with the diagnosis of a so-called GLEE one altered soft tissue tumor. And hopefully um, on the line, a, a number of you are wondering, well, what, what is a GLEE one altered soft tissue tumor? I haven't heard of this before. And I hope that that's the case. And, and, and I want to reassure you that this will be um, coming up in the next uh, iteration of the WHO classification. This is an emerging entity, uh, which um, is only recently come to light or has only recently come to light. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, you will all become acquainted with uh, in the coming uh, months and years. So these are mesenchymal neoplasms of uncertain histogenesis. They're typically characterized by an epithelioid morphology and a GLE-1 alteration. And that GLE-1 alteration may be a fusion gene like the case that I just presented. Alternatively, they may be the result of GLE-1 amplification. So akin to MDM2 amplification in liposarcomas, um, a, a significant subset of these tumors may have GLE-1 alteration. These are very rare tumors. They commonly present in young adults, uh, but have a wide range of involvement. They occur in the soft tissue, the bone, and viscera, but have a predilection for the head and neck, with about 40% of cases of rising in the head and neck, and in particular, the tongue, as in this case. The vast majority of these tumors have a relatively indolent clinical course, but up to 20% of them can metastasize. So it's important to communicate this information in your report for the clinicians. The case I showed had a relatively prototypic morphology, but I should emphasize that these tumors have a relatively broad morphologic spectrum. Um, they're frequently multilobulated, um, but they can be infiltrative. Uh, they often have sheets and nests of cells, but they can have fascicles, cords, and even pseudo rosettes and reticular patterns. The cells range from spindled to epithelioid, although the epithelioid morphology is that which was originally recognized in most of the early descriptions. Um, and the nuclei tend to be relatively monomorphic. One feature that is potentially helpful is the presence in a subset of cases of uh, protrusion of the tumor cells into vascular spaces. And I'll show you an example of that uh, in a moment. Like so many undifferentiated mesenchymal tumors, uh, immunohistochemistry tends to be of limited value here. So I mentioned that these, that the case I showed had a bit of S100 staining. Um, many of these tumors have variable S100 staining. They may have SMA, but nothing that you would really rely on to make a diagnosis. The subset of tumors that have GLE-1 amplification, uh, and I should mention just to step back, GLE-1 is on chromosome 12 in the same vicinity as MDM2. So when you have GLE-1 amplification, MDM2, which tends to be close by, often is uh, co-amplified. So for example, a, a tumor that has GLE-1 amplification uh, will also have MDM2 amplification by fish. But likewise, as a surrogate marker, you can have MDM2 overexpression at the protein level. So immunohistochemistry for MDM2 or CDK4 can also be potentially helpful in the subset of cases that do have GLE-1 amplification. Uh, but molecular testing is really the gold standard when it comes to making this diagnosis. Most tumors have a fusion uh, involving GLE-1 and the uh, ACT-B or actin gene. A subset have patch-1 fusions, mallet-1 fusions, and then a few other uh, potential entities. I'm sure more will be emerging in the literature uh, in the years ahead. <laughs> 
taking a step back to the differential diagnosis, we, we never want to miss the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma. And as I mentioned, there is a large cell variant of Ewing sarcoma, but most of us are well acquainted with um, the prototypic Ewing sarcoma. And you can see here um, that uh, of a case arising in the sinonasal tract, which is characterized by a relatively well demarcated lobulated pattern. And at higher magnification, nests of cells that on higher magnification are round to polygonal, relatively scant cytoplasm and indistinct cell borders, and just relatively monomorphic nuclei, some apoptotic debris and um, occasional mitotic activity. And really with these tumors, um, you can get quite far with morphology, but molecular testing obviously gives you the reassurance you need uh, to uh, clinch the diagnosis. And in this case here, um, in e the prototypic EWSR1 Fly1 fusion, we're seeing more and more um, fusion partners in um, not only Ewing sarcoma, but other tumors that may have Ewing's or FUS partners. So you can run into potential uh, difficulties in some cases with uh, assays like FISH or RT-PCR. RT-PCR is becoming increasingly cumbersome when it comes to diagnosing these tumors. Um, but obviously many labs face many different challenges and for many parts of the world, uh, molecular testing is still some time off in the future. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that by showing a, a range of morphologies and immunophenotypes and molecular testing, you'll find something in your practice that is relevant to you. But I'm, I'm just um, here trying to highlight some of the potential benefit for molecular testing. Um, and, and so you can at least think how this will be incorporated down the road in your practice. And related to that, here's an example of an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, again, arising in the sinonasal tract. You can see here, it's not uncommon to get quite a bit of crush artifact as a matter of uh, the methods of procurement. Uh, but we do often have areas of a more nested architecture. And on higher magnification, uh, the cells tend to have relatively monomorphic nuclei. But a very helpful discerning feature is the presence of diffuse myogenin in Desmond staining. Most tumors with rhabdomyoblastic differentiation uh, will only have patchy or focal myogenic staining. And so diffuse staining with myogenin can be the tip off that you're dealing with uh, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, and in particular, the solid variant, uh, which tends to be a little bit more challenging. Here, of course, molecular testing uh, confirmed the diagnosis. There's a PAX-3 FOXO1 fusion. Next, uh, also equally important, myoepithelial carcinoma. And important because this treatment here would be different, for example, compared to the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma from a clinical perspective. So here we have a tumor composed of nests of cells in a relatively desmoplastic background. The nuclei are relatively monomorphic at this intermediate magnification. And as we can see here at a higher magnification, we have a bit of necrosis centrally. Immunohistochemistry often shows a myoepithelial phenotype. And by that, I mean, you may have variable S100 or SOX10. You may have myogenic staining, so Desmond or SMA. You may have keratin or P63. There's quite a bit of variability in the immunophenotype of these tumors, which can make a diagnosis challenging. And some of them even have glial fibrillary acid protein expression, or GFAP. And this particular case uh, was positive uh, and, and had an EWSR1 ZNF444 fusion. And why is this important? And I actually, I'm just realizing now that I've shown you the, uh, the reciprocal fusion uh, in this case, it's normally EWSR1 on the, the um, uh, three prime end, but this um, has been switched around. Uh, you often get both calls when you get your molecular results. And why is this important in this case here? Well, this particular fusion, uh, and in this particular uh, fusion partner that is, uh, this is associated with a more aggressive clinical course, um, much as the biologic potential could have been predicted from morphology here. So just to show you a couple of more examples of GLI-1 altered soft tissue tumors. Here's another tumor arising in the tongue. You can see it's relatively well demarcated. On higher magnification, in contrast to the initial case I showed you, these uh, here are somewhat more spindled in morphology of the cells. On higher magnification, a bit of variability in cell uh, nuclear size and shape. A hint of myxoid stroma. Uh, and immunohistochemistry just showing patchy expression. These tumors I should emphasize are negative again for SOX10, much like the initial uh, case that we started with. So I think we're gonna see a trend here of unhelpful immunohistochemistry, particularly with S100 uh, in, in the first few examples I'm showing you today. Uh, this particular case um, 
another a tongue example, this with a mallet one glee one fusion. And here are the areas of vascular protrusion that I alluded to uh, earlier. Again, just emphasizing the variability in cell shapes. So here we've got, again, spindled tepithelioid cells, a nested pattern and often concentrated around vessels. And now moving to the third case. Uh, and this is a 31-year-old woman who presented with a right retromolar mass. So finally something uh, that you can really uh, uh, tie into an oral path perspective as something that you might see on a clinical basis and um, uh, at uh, the histology uh, aspect. And here you can see a uh, polypoid and neoplasm with a relatively um, bizarre uh, intermediate magnification, we can see almost these whorls and nests of cells that are spindle in the periphery and more polygonal or epithelioid centrally. Here's a higher magnification centrally showing these polygonal cells. Uh, elsewhere, areas of myxoid stroma and these spindled to uh, epithelioid cells uh, sort of admixed with this myxoid stroma. At higher magnification, you can appreciate occasional mitotic activity. And again, you know, the third clinical case now that I've showed you with this relatively patchy, uh, weak S100 staining, and this tumor was negative for S100. And so from this, I hope you're, you're starting to see that there's a, a pattern emerging in these tumors of relatively unhelpful morphology, relatively unhelpful immunophenotypes. Um, and, and while you can get quite far, oftentimes molecular testing might push you over the end when it comes to a definitive diagnosis. And so what might you wonder in this case? Could this be nodular fasciitis? Could this be a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma? Could this be the recently described uh, gingival fibroma that I'm sure most of you have seen and recognized for years and decades, but only now has an, a nice appellation to it? Or could this be an ectomesenchymal chondromyxoid tumor or something else altogether? So I submitted this case for molecular testing and lo and behold, it has an RREB1 MKL2 fusion in keeping with an ectomesenchymal chondromyxoid tumor. So what is ectomesenchymal chondromyxoid tumor? Well, these are neoplasms characterized by spindle to polygonal cells, often with areas of myxoid stroma and very rarely cartilaginous stroma. And the vast majority of these tumors harbor RREB1 MRTFB fusions. You'll notice that this name is slightly different than the molecular report that I just showed you, and that's because uh, the international nomenclature in this gene, like so many things, has changed and evolved in recent years. And so uh, it's important to know that uh, there is variability from time to time in how we name these genes and how this uh, influences our diagnosis when our diagnosis, in fact, are often reliant now in molecular uh, terms. Uh, more so in uh, hematolymphoid lesions, but also uh, emergingly so in mesenchymal tumors too, where tumors uh, or the name of tumors have uh, the fusion or genetic alteration in the name. So ectomies and chondromyxoid tumors are rare. There are fewer than 100 reported in the literature, but this probably just represents uh, under recognition of these entities. Uh, many of them will be misclassified as myoepithelial tumors, for example. These tumors across, occur across a broad range of ages, but predominate in young adults. They, um, up until recently, were thought to only occur in the tongue with a predilection for the anterodorsal aspect. But we now know, based on morphology and with the benefit of molecular testing, that they can have a broader anatomic distribution. They occur in the palate, the mandible, uh, in the gingiva, as I just showed in this particular case. Uh, and they tend to be cured by um, simple excision with negative margins. But as you'll see in a minute, this story is still emerging. and We can't necessarily uh, rely on this at this point. Again, these tumors have a broad morphologic spectrum. They're often multi-lobulated, unencapsulated, but they can be infiltrative and they can arise in bone. They are arranged in sheets and fascicles and may have reticular patterns. The cells range from spindle, distillate to polygonal. So again, I hope you're seeing that there's a broad range of morphologies and it's important, very important to be aware of this spectrum. Otherwise you might run the risk of missing this entity. Importantly, they tend to be relatively bland in terms of their nuclear features. They may have scattered atypia and, and helpful is the presence of binucleation, particularly in chondroid areas. 
by immunohistochemistry, they have a polyphenotypic uh, immunophenotype. So they may have GFAP. There's variable expression of S100, Desmond's, SMA, uh, even myogenin. And again, the effusion gene um, is present in the vast majority, if not all of these cases. So nodular fasciitis occurs in the head and neck. Here's a case, uh, this actually, you can see skeletal muscle here, this occurred in the, uh, the cheek. Uh, this is a uh, lobulated, uh, albeit implicated neoplasm. Uh, here we can see a sort of storiform to fascicular pattern. We've got these areas of feathery degeneration up in the superior aspect, intermediate magnification highlighting again, degeneration and mixoid stroma. On higher magnification, scattered lymphocytes, these bland spindle distillate cells. And importantly, we don't see any prominent extravasation of erythrocytes, something that most of us uh, tend to look for when thinking about nodular fasciitis. We often uh, are lucky if we find an osteoclast type giant cell interspersed. These tumors are SMA positive. And by molecular uh, testing characterized by an MYH9 USB6 fusion. Low-grade uh, mix, uh, sorry, low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma frequently occurs in the head and neck, and these unfortunately too can show a relatively broad morphologic spectrum. We generally think of them as having a very fibrous and myxoid background, but in reality it can be often reversed. On higher magnification, these tumors tend to be spindle to stellate. The nuclei are bland. You may have uh, more prominent myxoid stroma. And most of us tend to look for these vascular arcades or curvilinear vessels, and this particular case is lacking that. So again, it's important to have a relatively open mind when approaching mesenchymal tumors, because it's not hard to imagine how somebody might look at this and wonder about something like a desmoplastic fibroblastoma or even a desmoid tumor, which if you're fortunate to have seen enough of these, um, you know, you would perhaps easily uh, removed from the differential. But if you're in a practice where you're not seeing a lot of mesenchymal tumors, it's easy to get into trouble quite quickly. On higher magnification, we can appreciate uh, occasional mitotic activity. And if your lab has this stain, MUC4 is often uh, very, very helpful because the vast majority of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcomas are positive for this stain. But like so many immunohistochemical markers, it's important to know that they can occur at other uh, sites. So for example, uh, MUC4 can be expressed in, in many other tumors. Uh, for example, meningiomas, um, a subset of dedifferentiated leprosarcomas, and even other entities. So again, you've got to be very careful when choosing your workup for these neoplasms. This particular case was positive for MUC, or sorry, for FUS4, or sorry, FUS and uh, CREB3L2, uh, and, and of course positive for um, uh, the MUC immunostain. And you may be wondering. Uh, will I ever see these uh, in the head and neck? And will I even see this in the oral mucosa? And, and the answer is yes. And I just want to use here um, a, a lovely case that was um, actually shared with me by my oral pathology colleague here at Mount Sinai, Dr. Uh, Iona Leong, who actually trained in South Africa. Uh, and uh, this excellent oral pathology resident who is now in practice, uh, Catherine Laliberté. And, and this particular case is exceptional because this patient presented about two decades ago with a bland spindle cell neoplasm that had been diagnosed um, uh, in the past as a bland fibroma. And she presented two years later with a tumor, uh, an interosseous mass that has this uh, spindle to epithelioid morphology. And when uh, shown this case, I recognize this as being a sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma. We did the molecular, which confirmed the diagnosis. And, and subsequently, uh, it was uh, reported by our, our, our excellent fellow at the time, our resident at the time. And just to emphasize that you can see these tumors not only in the soft tissue, but also in the bone. So it's really important, again, to have a very broad and open mind when approaching these tumors. Here's the recently reported gingival fibroma, which I think all of you will recognize at low power. Uh, these tumors often have, uh, first of all, they're non-neoplastic. They often have these ectatic vessels in the periphery, this collagenous to myxoid stroma, bland uh, nuclear details may or may not have rare mitotic activity, whoops. Uh, and then just circling back to ectomesic chymochondrium mixoid tumor, just to show you a few additional examples to emphasize the morphologic spectrum that you might see. So here's another molecularly confirmed case on the tongue, uh, perhaps a bed of ulceration in the past. We've got these 
hypocellular areas with myxoid stroma, these spindle cells almost uh, with an onion skin pattern around them, multinucleation, some scattered nuclear atypia, uh, an example with abundant myxoid stroma, and even uh, phocondroid differentiation with cells in lacunae with binucleation. Here's another ex uh, excellent example of a case. This one actually was reported by my colleague uh, at a hospital just north of me, uh, Dr. Tra Trong. Um, who actually did his graduate studies with me. He reported this case uh, with us that it was confirmed by molecular. Uh, it originated in bone and then blew out of the bone. And you can see on low magnification, these lobulated areas that are relatively hypocellular, the spindle, the cellate cells with myxoid stroma, areas suggestive of hyaline cartilage. So again, just to emphasize that these tumors not only occur in the soft tissue of the tongue, but elsewhere in the head and neck. And I have here a just an, an one more case that's really quite spectacular and I wanted to share. This, this is a case that actually was forwarded to me for molecular confirmation by um, an oral pathologist in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Rana um, Alshgrud, um, and who was also uh, involved, uh, Dr. Ionis uh, Kutlis. And they sent this case to me for molecular confirmation. And you can see here this tumor that has a prototypic low power magnification, but on higher magnification has quite a different morphology. We've got sheets of small round cells. And it would not be hard to imagine seeing this or a needle core biopsy through this or a tumor that's overrun with this morphology, how you might not even remotely consider the possibility of this diagnosis. So again, it's really important to have um, a, an open mind, to have abundant sampling if possible, and the availability of molecular testing to make some of these diagnoses. Moving next to the fourth case, and we've, we've had a number of challenging cases, so I hope for, for now we'll, we'll have a couple of easy ones. This is an 81-year-old patient who presented with a past history of hemangiopericytoma in the sinonasal tract. And I think most of you know some of the nuances of the application of this term, and we will get into that for a moment. So here we have a biopsy of the recurrent tumor. You can see this lobulated neoplasm with prominent ectatic and occasionally branching vessels. Again, uh, intermediate magnification, emphasizing the vasculature here. On higher magnification, we've got these sheets and fascicles of spindle cells. Uh, they seem to be swirling around vessels and meandering off into nether regions. By immunohistochemistry, this tumor is positive for CD34 and positive for SMA. And a reasonable differential diagnosis here would include solitary fibrous tumor, glomangiopericytoma. You might wonder, based on the vasculature, also the possibility of mesenchymal chondrosarcoma or even synovial sarcoma. And the helpful clue, and I suspect that 99% of you have uh, reached it, is the presence of immunohistochemistry for beta-catenin. And if I had sent this off for molecular testing, uh, it would likewise have a, a beta-catenin mutation. So this obviously confirms a diagnosis of glomangiopericytoma. So you all know these are benign tumors with uh, bona fide parasitic differentiation. They're relatively common. They occur somewhat more often in females than males, and they have a predilection for seniors. They'll can occur at just about any age, and they often present with nasal obstruction or epistaxis, as you would expect uh, for a tumor in that location. They tend to be unencapsulated. They can be polypoid and or infiltrative, and again, have this relatively bland characteristic set of morphology. Rarely, rarely, you can see polymorphism in these tumors. And by immunohistochemistry, they're positive for SMA, beta-catenin. And again, uh, by molecular testing, you can clinch the diagnosis when presented with limited samples. But 99 times out of 100, you will not need that. Solitary fibrous tumors obviously occur in the head and neck and in the oral uh, cavity and sinonasal tract. Uh, here's an example which doesn't really have the prototypic morphology of SFT, and they can be challenging. We've got fascicles of spindle cells that are infiltrative, a somewhat storiformed fasicular pattern. On higher magnification, mitotic activity, albeit rare, 
immunohistochemistry is positive for STAT6. And with this, you really don't need to wonder or worry about molecular testing. But I must emphasize that, like so many of these um, typically disease defining immunohistochemical stains, you can see expression in other entities. So, for example, STAT6 has been reported um, in other entities, like, for example, dedifferentiated liposarcoma. So, just a note of caution when using these markers. Molecular testing, of course, can help the diagnosis, and in this case, the uh, disease-defining NAB2 STAT6 fusion was present. Most of you would recognize this as being the prototypic morphology for solitary fibrous tumor, these ectatic branching vessels, these thick collagen bundles, this patternless architecture. But I just want to take a moment to emphasize the broad morphologic diversity of these tumors. They can be cellular. Uh, they can have spindle cells that are a little bit more fascicular. They can be hypocellular with abundant collagenous stroma. They can have mixoid stroma with areas of mixoid degeneration. Solitary fibrous tumors can even have fatty differentiation. And then finally, um, well, nearly finally, they can be a round or epithelioid in morphology and have brisk mitotic activity. And they can also have um, pleomorphism. So here we see lots of these enlarged pleomorphic cells. Um, and morphologically and immunophenotypically, they can de-differentiate. They can lose CD34. They can even lose NAB or STAT6 expression. But fortunately, the molecular underpinnings don't change, and molecular will always be there to uh, bail you out with a particularly difficult case. Now, uh, grasping at a differential, but trying to emphasize the ectatic branching vasculature. Here we've got an example of a mesenchymochondrosarcoma, again, with these branching ectatic vessels. And on higher magnification, you can see a hint of hyaline cartilag uh, cartilaginous stroma. Again, it can be very subtle and can almost look mixoid. Molecular testing here confirms a HAY1-NCOA2 fusion. Synovial sarcoma can also have a characteristic branching vasculature. And it's so important not to overlook this diagnosis because it obviously has significant implications for patients. But uh, here we have a tumor with a branching ectatic vasculature, spindled tepithelioid cells, relatively minimal variability in cell size and shape. Occasionally, you can have mitotic activity, particularly in the dedifferentiated form, and molecular here. Um, saving the day and confirming a diagnosis as the gold standard, but oftentimes you can get all the way there and not need molecular testing. So just a couple of cases to emphasize the morphologic findings in this tumor. And in contrast to the three other patients that I presented, I think you will agree that the morphologic spectrum of these tumors is relatively narrow. They all look relatively similar. They all have a similar vasculature, the same flowing streams of spindle cells. Another case, same flowing streams of cells, vague vesicular pattern, they can have interstitial hemorrhage and ulceration and hemosiderin deposition. And with that, you often get a bit of reactive atypia. The vessels um, quite characteristic along with a bit of hint of mixoid stroma. But again, almost virtually morphologically identical from case to case to case. So the fifth case I have for you is that of a 61-year-old patient who presented with osteoporosis. And in her workup was found to have a, um, a synonasal, no, actually, I, correct me, uh, I, this is an oral uh, mass. You can see we've got a bit of uh, bone here, but the vast majority of the specimen is composed of these sheets of spindled to polygonal cells. And on higher magnification, you can appreciate here more of a spindled morphology with a reticular pattern, some mixoid stroma, and areas that are a little bit uh, different morphologically. We've got somewhat uh, almost uh, loose collagenous or grungy collagenous stroma. Higher magnification, just again, showing the smudged to grunginess uh, when it comes to the collagenous stroma. And for those of you that are not a fan of Nirvana and grunge metal or music, here we've got even more grungy material, but this in the form of grungy calcification. So uh, a morphology that's a little bit loose and carefree. And with all of these buzzwords, I hope that uh, there's a tumor entity that's rolling uh, through your mind when I bring you the differential. And that differential would include a phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor. It might raise the possibility of osteosarcoma, and you might even wonder about an ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. 
And in this particular case, I did immunohistochemistry for SATB2 and the tumor was diffusely positive. I again, as a word of caution, should emphasize that SATB2 can be positive not only in tumors with osteoblastic differentiation, you can also see it in uh, tumors of the lower GI tract, you can see it in a number of different things. So caution is advised with this excellent stain. This tumor was also positive for ERG and together um, is quite helpful and would make you think about this and that's phosphateric mesenchymal tumor. In this particular case, um, the patient not only had osteoporosis, she presented with uh, tumor-induced osteomalacia. And in the course of her workup was found to have uh, an FGF 23 that was almost 10 times normal. So uh, obviously the result of this small, relatively banal tumor. So phosphateric mesenchymal tumors, uh, Andrew Fulp really um, has really uh, described and, and opened up this entity uh, to bring it to the state that we recognize it in its uh, current form. These are distinctive neoplasms that are often um, associated with tumor-induced osteomalacia, but not always. They're usually uh, caused through the production of FGF23. They're relatively rare tumors and they have a predilection for the head and neck. Uh, they are often paradox paradoxically small, and they can arise in the bone and um, soft tissue for the most part. Uh, the morphology is relatively uh, diverse. They often contain spindle cells and sheets. Um, they may have a somewhat more epithelial appearance from time to time. The stroma is often basophilic and smudgy is the adjective that many people throw out. They often have grungy or flocculent calcification, uh, but this may be less prevalent in the head and neck location. The immunohistochemical phenotype is variable, but you are quite lucky if you get ERG and SAPI2 and D240 staining. You can use ISH for FGF3 or FGF23, and about half of cases have uh, diagnostic fusion genes, uh, generally involving FN1 with uh, one of multiple different fusion partners. And if at a loss for um, ancillary molecular techniques, you can always ask the clinician to send these off for uh, serologic testing. Osteosarcoma, obviously a huge concern in the head and neck, and we see them from time to time. Here's a case where the tumor is relatively deep, and you can see a lot of granulation to tissue overlying it. And many of us often worry about, are we getting a superficial biopsy and missing a lesion, particularly when we've got discordant radiology? Uh, so you have to be quite careful. Here we have an intermediate magnification and spindled to polygonal to epithelioid cell with a very, very subtle hint of osteoid interspersed. On a higher magnification, again, you just get this gentle, subtle hint of these delicate bands of osteoid in a, in a filigree-like pattern. And here we've got it again on higher magnification. It's very, very subtle. You might look at something like this and wonder, is it just collagen or organizing fibrin? It can be very, very challenging. But luckily here, we've got lots of mitotic activity and a radiology that's compatible. And occasionally, uh, you'll get really lucky and you'll have um, mineralization of the osteoid to really help pull you over um, the finish line with this diagnosis. Ossifying fibromyxoid tumor can have a broad morphologic spectrum. They're often circumscribed and they often lack the prototypic peripheral shell or rim of ossification as seen in this case here, missing. We have areas of cystic or microcystic degeneration, cords of epithelioid cells with myxoid stroma, often bands of collagen. And for those of you in the audience that aren't uh, restricted in your practice to oral pathology in the head and neck, and if you ever see gynecologic tumors from time to time, uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma is likewise characterized uh, by these, uh, by similar morphology and by these similar starburst, so-called starburst patterns of collagen, and often has molecular overlap as well, ESS. And here again, a higher magnification emphasizing the uh, collagen that we often see in ossifying propermixoid tumor and the prototypic uh, fusion gene, although there's a range of fusions in these tumors. And just to circle back to uh, phosphatric mesenchymal tumor and to show some of the morphologic diversity, here's an incisional biopsy. At low power, you can appreciate the grungy calcification, the smudgy collagen. Again, the osteoid or sorry, mineralization, that's min uh, grungy, more grungy calcification. Occasional osteoclast type giant cells are frequently there and helpful. Hyalinized vessels. And in this particular case, this tumor had an FN1 FGF R1 fusion, which helped uh, clinch the diagnosis. Here's another case, obviously involving bone. Uh, 
a somewhat different morphology, more spindle cells here, areas of microcystic degeneration, relatively bland set of morphology, and here lacking the grungy calcification um, and lacking the sort of smudgy uh, stroma. Here, lots and lots of grungy calcification and a uh, co confirmatory fusion gene. So with that, uh, we've gone through five cases. Uh, and at the end of a day, we, we typically think we've got most of the cases off of our desk. But I do have a few minutes remaining. And as is often the case, just as we're getting ready to leave on a Friday afternoon, a colleague will come in and show us a case, or we'll get a last minute frozen section. And so I have one quick case, uh, and that's a 46-year-old male who presented with an inner ear uh, skull base mass. He had a prior biopsy showing squamous cell carcinoma with basaloid features. And this case was actually referred to me by my friend and colleague, uh, Alain Weinreb, uh, who's a prominent head and neck pathologist here in Toronto. And he asked me if I would do molecular testing to rule out a nut M1 fusion, for which I'm always happy to oblige. And you can see here the tumor. We've got sheets of cells with a somewhat basaloid pattern. Um, again, emphasizing that basaloid morphology sheets of spindle depithelioid cells. Immunohistochemistry is positive for keratins, particularly the high molecular weight keratins, P40 and P63. The prior uh, fish uh, at an outside hospital was negative for EWSR1, so this is not the adamantinoma-like variant of Ewing's that many of us will worry about in the head and neck. And so you'd wonder about a snuck. You'd wonder about myoepithelial carcinoma with this. You'd wonder about uh, nut midline fusion or nut midline carcinoma associated with a nut M1 fusion. So here's our snuck. Here's a myoepithelial carcinoma, the same case that we showed earlier. Here's a nut midline carcinoma. Often you're lucky and you'll get areas of uh, squamoid differentiation. It may be focal. Molecular testing here was done and it showed a DEC AFF2 fusion gene. And Hopefully many of you again here are looking at a fusion and puzzling and wondering what does this mean? Well, this means that we can confirm a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma, but it's in quotes. And that's because uh, at the time when I received this result, I excitedly contacted Alan and I said, you know, you've got a fusion and it so happens there's a precedent in the literature. And, and, and why is this important? Well, this is a case uh, that had previously been reported and had an exceptional response to immunotherapy, which most of you are aware of now is quite a, an active buzzword in uh, medical oncology fields. And so uh, Alan went back and he looked at his archives and he sent me another case. Um, and here you can see it here, it has a somewhat different morphology, a more epithelioid, prominent cuffs of crushed cells and uh, even lymphocytes and by immunohistochemistry, again, keratin positive and P40 positive. Uh, and had the same fusion. And so Alon with his head and neck fellow at the time did an excellent job getting this out into the literature. And very quickly, this was followed by a, a, a case report by um, the excellent uh, Justin Bishop who confirmed these findings. Uh, and then Justin uh, very recently put together a lovely case series um, uh, with uh, Lisa Ruper uh, tying all of this together and, and really solidifying this as a novel entity that typically occurs in the head and neck. Uh, and since then, uh, there's been a, uh, another paper that even showed that the morphology of these tumors can be even broader. And, and this uh, uh, more recently coming out showing the same fusion gene in a papillary squamous cell carcinoma. So all to emphasize the fact that you can have a broad morphologic spectrum of these entities. Molecular testing can often be quite helpful in confirming the diagnosis. And in some cases is relevant because this may have therapeutic relevance for the patient. So just to circle back, uh, it's really important and must be emphasized that having an organized approach to mesenchymal tumors is helpful, making sure that we're not dealing with metastasis or uh, in the latter case, a non-mesenchymal neoplasm. It's important to consider tumors that are inherently located in the head and neck or oral mucosa, as this case may be, uh, as well as those that may have a predilection. And, and, and hopefully in the future, this will be updated with a new WHO for the head and neck and you'll all have access to this and, and, and use it as a, a valuable reference. And in summary, the head and neck is a relatively common site for mesenchymal tumors. Uh, the diagnosis of these tumors can be challenging, not only because of their rarity, but because of the broad morphologic spectrum. 
This morphologic spectrum um, and, molecular, and diversity of these entities, in fact, is complicated by the fact that not only morphologically do they overlap, but they overlap with their immunohistochemical phenotype um, and even molecular. There are some molecular fusions that uh, show player trophy. They can be the same fusion characterizing one entity as an altogether different entity. So for example, hyalinizing clear cell sarcoma or carcinoma rather has the same uh, fusion gene as um, uh, primary pulmonary um, myxoid sarcoma, as clear cell sarcoma soft tissue, um, as uh, clear cell sarcoma of the GI tract. These are all the same fusion arising in different tumors with different uh, biologies. So it's really important not just to put all of your eggs in a morphologic basket or an immunohistochemical basket or a molecular basket, but it's our job to tie these all together uh, in coming up with a diagnosis. These fusions uh, or molecular assays can be helpful for helping us identify new and emerging entities, but their greatest weight is really helping us just uh, put the final nail in a diagnosis or getting us across that finish line as the gold standard in confirming a diagnosis. Um, and also, uh, and perhaps more so in the future, uh, availing our patients to more specific and targeted therapies. And in the seconds remaining, I'd like to just thank uh, the numerous people here at my institution that have helped uh, in supporting my work, the funding that I've received from a number of generous organizations, and the terrific collaborators that I've had, particularly when it comes to mesenchymal tumors and uh, tumors of the head and neck. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Brennan. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat uh, function, I can. I'm just calling it up now. Yeah, if we could go back to the first one, uh, I think from Cisco Madi. Uh, so the first question is, uh, is the RREB1 MRTFB fusions um, possibly involved in benign, uh, biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma? And is there a possible link? And so uh, this is an excellent question, uh, a truly excellent and um, on-point question, because uh, very recently, and, and I believe it was in the last five or six months, an article came out in a Genes, Chromosome, and Cancer showing the um, RREB1 MRT uh, FB fusion as arising in biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. So there's now one case in the literature suggesting that this fusion, as I just alluded at the end of the talk, may show molecular pleiotrophy. It's the same fusion, but occurring in two completely different tumor types. And with this question, that the more nuanced implication, are these two tumor types related? And the answer is it's far too early to know for sure. Um, morphologically, these tumors don't show any overlap. So the early answer, my, 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 my initial answer to this question is no, they're probably different entities altogether. But really, we're, we're dealing with entities that are so exquisitely rare, it's just premature to say for sure. And I suspect that when we get more elegant uh, expression arrays studies done and where we can compare these tumors at a more uh, in-depth level, we may see that there are similarities or confirm that there are, in fact, differences. But this is an excellent question. And the answer, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say with certainty, but I think at this early stage, they're probably different. Um, but that may change in the future with uh, more refined work. Thank you, Sien. Uh, Liam, the next one from Liam. So Liam wonders, what is the incidence of RREB1 uh, MLK2 rearrangement in biphenotypic sinonasal sarcomas? Uh, and he's just alluded to this one uh, case in the, the oropharynx. So yeah, so uh, the oropharynx, the oral pharynx was the first report of the, sun, uh, the sarcoma in, um, in this fusion gene. And whether or not this uh, oral pharyngeal lesion is related to the uh, biphenotypic sononasal sarcoma of the um, sononasal tract still, is remain, well, still remains to be clarified. These tumors do have an overlapping morphology. Um, whether or not they're the same tumor type or not, and whether or not biphenotypic sononasal sarcoma, and, and, and this is... Uh, perhaps uh, dangerous territory, but whether or not, as the name of this tumor implies, uh, is it restricted to the sinonasal tract or not, uh, remains to be clarified. And in fact, based on this report of this laryngeal lesion from the French group, um, it's possible that in the future, we will see that these tumors are no longer intrinsically related to the sinonasal tract, and they may have a broader anatomic distribution. Uh, so Liam, to your question, it's, it's premature to say for sure. Um, uh, the incidents because right now we're just dealing with case reports. And, and in this particular case, we're dealing with two case reports at two different anatomic locations. 
but I suspect as more and more people are adopting next generation sequencing as a routine diagnostic assay, we're going to start seeing a lot more case series and eventually a much better clear picture on, on, on this, this and many other questions. So, so again, you're, 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 you're just nudging into the future there and perhaps a project for you uh, down the road if you have the inclination. The next question, uh, also from Liam, is what is your best IHC panel for Glee One Altered Soft Tissue Tumors? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Uh, some of our earlier work with Glee One, uh, uh, Christina Antonescu and I, um, showed that the vast majority of these tumors have S100 staining. So I would do S100 and SOX10, and you may get lucky and have S100 staining. And that S100 staining with the appropriate morphology might make the diagnosis. Um, but I tend to have a very stereotypic uh, panel when it comes to spindle cell tumors and epithelioid tumors. And to this question, uh, Liam, I'd probably throw in, in addition to those neural markers, SMA, Desmond, CD34, um, keratin, um, and EMA. And I would also throw in, uh, hoping against hope that I'd get an MDM2 associated uh, subtype. So would the MDM2 be positive or CDK4, would it be positive? And that might be the tip off that I'm dealing with the MDM2 amplifier, or sorry, the GLEE1 amplified subtype. That might be the best hint that you get at confirming a diagnosis without using molecular testing. So that would be my panel. Um, I realize that these are markers that may not necessarily be um, available in many labs. Most community labs, for example, wouldn't have MDM2. Um, so at the end of the day, I think your standard spindle or epithelioid panel combined with morphology may be all that you need to raise that possibility. Would it matter from the clinical perspective? Well, because about 20% of them locally recur, you'd want to advise re-excision with negative margins, um, but that would be true of many of the entities that we discussed already today. So if you can't uh, be definitive in the diagnosis, I think you're still being quite helpful in suggesting it in the differential. Next, we have uh, Robert Kennedy, who has asked, um, do you have an opinion on ad the adenomato adenomatoid variant of Ewing sarcoma versus myoepithelial carcinoma? Um, probably a question that uh, is best answered when not being recorded. This is, um, this is a controversial entity. Uh, there are some people that staunchly believe that these are Ewing sarcoma, and there are others that believe that these are probably yet another example of molecular pleiotrophy where the EWSR1 fly one fusion gene um, defines two different entities. So as of the current WHO, EWSR1 fly one is disease defining for Ewing sarcoma. This particular group of entities that often has epithelial differentiation um, and keratin expression um, tends to have a slightly different biologic potential, although the literature is limited in terms of cases and so it's hard to say for sure. And this has prompted some to wonder whether or not these are distinct entities, perhaps related to myoepithelial carcinoma. Um, and I think it's too soon, again, to answer this definitively. I'd really like to see expression analysis. Uh, I'd really like to see larger cohorts to say for sure. Um, but uh, Robert, to this question, I will say that I frequently do keratin on Ewing sarcomas and P63 uh, outside of the head and neck, and they are often are positive for keratin. And I think the literature quotes a number uh, somewhere in around 20% or 10 to 20% if I'm not mistaken. And they can also often have S100, which likewise is a marker of myoepithelial differentiation. So these peripheral examples often have a similar morphology. Uh, they often have a similar amino phenotype. They may not necessarily have the, the squamoid differentiation that we attribute to ad the adenomatum-like uh, variant. So I think it becomes very, very tricky to come down um, definitively on um, this, this, this question based on the literature to date. Um, so I think this is another one where we're going to wait and see what the literature shows, and in particular, with the benefit of much more um, uh, comprehensive RNA sequencing in the future to see the breadth of these tumors that, for example, in the periphery may have been called a squamous cell carcinoma, may have been called a myoepithelial tumor uh, before we really commit to something like this and look at changing something like the WHO. But again, you know, these are all tremendous questions, and I think these are all questions that are really on the, the leading edge of the issues that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and how we classify these tumors and things that really need to be sorted out in the literature. Uh, the next question, in the uh, 2017 head and neck WHO, sandonasal parasitoma is categorized under borderline low-grade malignant. Um, will it be regarded as borderline 
uh, sorry, will it be regarded as benign in the future? That's an excellent question. Um, I, uh, I have to confess, I, um, I've uh, been involved as an author or co-author on a couple of sections in the upcoming WHO, and I haven't looked to see if in this particular case the classification has changed. Um, so I don't know, uh, is my answer to this question. Would I be surprised if it changed? I, you know, I think it's really, really important that we as pathologists communicate uncertainty in our reports. Um, and there are a lot of tumors, for example, a solitary fibrous tumor, where we can have biologic potentials that are difficult to predict. And we as pathologists want to be helpful, and we want to tell our clinicians definitively, this is tumor X, Y, and Z. We want to be definitive in our diagnosis, and we want to be definitive in predicting the biologic potential. And I think sometimes that we get into trouble by saying too much. And when we have tumors that can recur locally with negative margins, or in the case of a curatage where it's difficult for us to assess, uh, or we have tumors that can have infiltrative peripheral, um, peripheral margins and they can locally recur, I think we get into trouble when we say benign or intermediate biologic potential or malignant. Sometimes I think it's important that we just communicate A, the diagnosis, but also communicate the fact that these tumors can have the potential for locally aggressive biologic potential um, and, 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 and how, how we define malignant. I mean, if you go to our standard references like Robin's textbook of pathology, well, what, what is neoplasia or uh, what is a cancer? What is malignant? I mean, these terms that we throw around um, in our day-to-day -day life and with our trainees are things that we, 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 we somewhat take for granted when we try to get to the nuts and bolts of what does it mean to be a cancer? Or what does it mean to be malignant? Um, you know, how do we define it? Uh, you know, metastatic potential or local aggressive potential, things tend to break down. Um, so to this question, you know, does it matter if we change um, the biologic potential? I, I don't think it really matters so much. Um, I wouldn't really uh, be upset if the categorization in the WHO changed one way or the other, um, but it's an excellent question. But I, I do answer this in a very waffly kind of way um, and, and, and to take you out and a bit of a tangent to, to just emphasize that I think we really have to acknowledge the differences in the biologic of these biologic potential of these tumors. Uh, and, and, and really our job as pathologists is to communicate and to make sure that our clinicians know what to expect so that there aren't surprises down the road if a patient's discharged from follow-up or if a tumor locally recurs. Uh, the next question, uh, have you seen any cases of malignant phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor? Um, I have seen a number of cases that I've classified as phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor. I have not classified any as malignant per se. Uh, do they exist? Um, the literature only contains case reports um, and the classification is somewhat difficult because um, the literature doesn't necessarily always involve the same degree of molecular testing. Could these be entities that have been misclassified? So um, the straight up answer to the question is no, I haven't seen any cases. Uh, is it possible that they exist? I have no doubt that um, somebody somewhere has a rigorously annotated molecularly confirmed case that does have um, a malignant morphology and an immunophenotype. Uh, next, um, a very kind comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, another very nice, uh, several, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for all of these uh, really, really helpful and uh, forms of feedback and, and, and comments. I uh, very much appreciate it. Um, uh, ah, uh, we have we have an interesting, uh, somewhat pithy comment, and I was hoping somebody might say this. I'm already missing the days we could make a diagnosis without molecular. I'm so <laughs> glad somebody said that. And I suspect the same attitude uh, would have been present in the early 1990s when immunohistochemistry came out. Goodness gracious, we could have diagnosed so much with a special stain. I, I long for the days of the PAS and that GMS. Um, and, and my von Hirenboff stain, like we're evolving. And, and, and I think what I take away from comments like this, and I, and I too, I'm getting a little bit long in the tooth and I do long for, for days when I could sign something out with morphology alone. Um, I think we're actually in a really privileged time now because right now we're enjoying um, molecular as it's taking off and it's gonna go quite far uh, as an adjunct for our diagnostic abilities. Uh, and it's not gonna replace it. I mean, again, because so many fusions characterize the exact same different entities, you still need morphology, you still need immunohistochemistry. And really um, comments like this are, are soon, I suspect, gonna be replaced by 
artificial intelligence. I long for the days where I could diagnose something without a computer scanning it first and spitting out a differential diagnosis. So, um, you know, thank you for this comment. I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree with it. Uh, and I think that uh, it's really up to us to embrace the present and to embrace the future and to lead the way rather than having our clinicians um, take it away from us. And that would be the real concern with molecular techniques and with AI. Um, and with that, I think um, I, I thank you another nice uh, comment, which I appreciate. Uh, if there are any other um, uh, questions, um, uh, please uh, speak now, or uh, if you don't want to forever hold your peace, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'm more than happy to, uh, to take these up in the future. Uh, but thank you very much. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have spoken today, and um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to touch a broad and diverse audience with, uh, with this rather esoteric topic. Yeah, no, thank you, Bruno. Uh, just to latch on to what you've said, uh, I mean, being somebody who was also trained in the 80s, I was telling my registrars, those were the days when uh, MFH was MFH was the most common sarcoma. <laughs> it was fairly easy those days, but be, yes, it may. Bruno, uh, from our side, uh, our department and our institution, thanks a lot for an excellent uh, presentation. I mean, you can look at the comments and that is a reflection of that. The structured way you've done that, uh, the beautifully demonstrated uh, uh, differential diagnosis and the emphasis on the entities as well. I think for everybody who, who attended, it was worth a while. Uh, uh, and thank you to be part of this invited guest lecture series for the effort you've put in uh, and we all appreciate it. Much appreciated from pathologists all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And to the rest of the colleagues, thank you for attending. Uh, please keep on uh, the open for our next invited speaker. Uh, and we really appreciate your participation in this, uh, this event. All the best to everybody. Thank you.